the summit we're at at the moment, the, the big focus is sustainability. A lot of technology is currently being pushed into this space as we try and make aviation technology. The big technology that we're talking about is sustainable aviation fuel. That's going to do a lot of the heavy lifting, but hydrogen and all kinds of other technologies beckon in the future. The target we have right now is to make aviation net zero carbon by 2050. Is that still achievable? It remains the target, and there are plenty of um, reasons to believe that it can be achieved. There are also some challenges. One of the reasons we have the summit, the ABBA summit, is to discuss those, uh, those topics, to understand better the problem, what goes well, what needs to be um, uh, done differently. At Airbus, we remain committed to the 2050 uh, objective of carbon neutrality. That's what the industry has uh, agreed together. And um, tomorrow, we will be sharing a lot of uh, good news on the progress. We know that on the sustainable aviation fuel, that's a challenge, and we need to do more work on it. Is it going to be possible with Donald Trump in the White House? He doesn't seem to see the United States as at the forefront of green technology. In fact, he's going in the opposite direction. Can 2050 be achieved with Donald Trump in the White House? Well, the progress we need to make um, to decarbonize uh, aviation by 2050 relies on different uh, pillars. One of them is, uh, is the planes, the plane themselves. That's what we are doing. And for planes, competitiveness means fuel efficiency and fuel efficiency means sustainability. So the two objectives are aligned. I say economy and ecology are aligned. So we'll keep going and airlines will continue to buy uh, preferably planes that burn less fuel, whatever the fuel. Uh, for the development of SAF, it's a, it's a bigger challenge. It's important to have unity. Uh, we need a global level playing field on SAF. Right. And obviously we need to understand better what it will mean for the US and to what extent the others uh, will keep going at the same pace. What should Europe go it alone? Well, anyway, we see uh, different dynamics in different places of the world. Europe has gone quite alone on the Fit for 55, uh, putting mandates on the use of SAF. It's a different way. It was already a different way with yep. the previous uh, US administration with IRA and subsidies for, uh, for SAF. And China is going also another way. That's one of the problems. We need this to be unified. You just come back from China. What did you see there? What kind of technology? Are they going to once again leapfrog in the way that we've seen maybe them doing in electric cars? I think they are really serious on uh, the transition. They're really serious on um, uh, decarbonized energy, yep. on the use of solar, uh, of wind, of nuclear. They grow. I think yep. uh, half or two thirds of the additional capacity of decarbonized energy uh, last year was coming from China. So they're really moving uh, forward at the, at the right pace. And yes, there, there is a likelihood that they would um, um, go faster than others on decarbonized technologies with the risk that we would see uh, in aviation, in fuels, uh, what we see today in electric cars. So we're really taking them serious, but there's also a partner we can rely on for the development of SAF. Let's talk a little bit about what is happening here in Europe. It seems at the moment that security is more, more important to Europe than sustainability. Do you see it that way? Is that how, is that how it is developing? I don't think it's more important. Uh, I think it's a precondition. Uh, you need security to have prosperity, yep. and you need prosperity to fund your uh, climate transition and your decarbonization. So security comes first, uh, and that's what we are looking and what we're seeing in, in Europe. I don't think there is competition between the different um, okay. investments, uh, at least at the moment, uh, at least for Airbus. Uh, we have different businesses. We have a strong balance sheet to fund the different investments. But yes, there is more that will go to space, to defense, than it was in the past. And that's an opportunity for us because we think uh, it's important for the security of Europe. You, you talk about space. One of the key pieces of technology that Europe is relying on at the moment is being used heavily in Ukraine is obviously Starlink. How quickly can Europe replicate something similar to what we see with Starlink? Right, Starlink is clearly a breakthrough. Um, the constellation uh, is already large in the air. Uh, we have constellations in Europe that are flying already, but they are much smaller. So we need a demand at scale. Uh, we need... Uh, countries to come together with a common need and we need the industry to come together to supply. Uh, so Europe needs scale. In terms of technologies, uh, we have very similar technologies, uh, but it needs to go into a project at scale. How quickly can you do that? Well, it's going to take a bit of time. Okay. Uh, we are moving as fast as we can. We have indicated that we are in discussions with Leonardo, our friends from right. Leonardo and Thales, uh, to create a, a joint company for uh, satellite manufacturing. It, it, can I think about that as an Airbus of space? Is that what we're, look, we're talking about here? It is an Airbus of space. It is a joint venture between companies, so that's probably a bit different, but that's creating the scale in Europe uh, to be able to be competitive on a global scale. Can you do the same thing in defense? 
It has to be done. It's going to be probably more difficult because the, uh, uh, the sovereignty uh, yeah. for security and defense is at the level of nations, of countries. And we need countries to come together with common projects to create that scale and then having the industry serving uh, these uh, projects at scale. But we're too fragmented in defense in Europe. That's very clearly written in the Draghi report. That's yeah. something that is now acknowledged. Uh, we need to find the solutions. So in terms of how you're thinking about how you develop Airbus from here, over the last few years, it has been civil focused. Do you see space, defense becoming similar scale arms of Airbus? People have often talked about defense being subscale at Airbus. Mm. Is that going to be the future? Is, is the defense arm going to be subscale? Is, is space going to be subscale? How quickly can you get it to scale? And, and will it be of something similar to what we see behind us in the civil side? Well, we are not only an Airbus in commercial, we are also yep. an Airbus in defense and in helicopters. Yep. We have created the scale in helicopters already in the past, and we are the number one uh, helicopter manufacturer in the world uh, by a turnover and by number of helicopters. So that's something uh, we are doing in other areas of business than commercial. Uh, yes, we are also an Airbus in defense with projects like the Eurofighter, yep. uh, with projects like the A400M, where European countries uh, partner together to create a product that is the best in yep. the world at the moment. But we need more of this. And it is the DNA of Airbus to bring collaboration, to bring partnerships, and to create um, projects that have the right scale, and therefore the right scale of investment, and therefore uh, the right competitiveness. Do you think Donald Trump is bringing Europe together? Do you think it's going to ha Europe relies on a crisis. Is this a big enough crisis to yeah, bring... Europe Europe is making progress through crisis. Uh, we are challenged by a number of yep. things changing in the world. Uh, the fact that Europe needs to take security and defense in its own hands is something that, uh, in my view, really makes sense. Um, and that's what Europe is doing under a number of uh, uh, pressure points. Yep. Uh, Ukraine is one of them, what's happening in Ukraine. And uh, also what uh, Donald Trump wants to achieve is another pressure point on, on Europe to take its uh, destiny in its hands. Um, Donald Trump talks about his favorite words being tariffs. What, what do you expect in terms of tariffs? How already is it impacting Airbus? The aircraft behind you, the A321 XLR, comes from around the world. We were joking earlier, the nose comes from France, the engines come from America and France. The, the, the aircraft is an aircraft of the world. But that creates vulnerability. How are you thinking about tariffs? What has the impact been already? Well, that's an important point for industry. We had tariffs uh, on aircraft uh, four to five years ago between the US and Europe, and has been a lose-lose. Uh, therefore, we had a ceasefire in 2021. And I think this experience um, has been interesting in, in showing that for a sort of North Atlantic ecosystem, both sides of the Atlantic, it is only lose-lose in putting tariffs. We have not heard about tariffs on uh, aviation at the moment, on aerospace. I think Are you that's preparing? A, I think that's a good sign. Um, there's nothing more, I would say, really to prepare than to communicate, yep. to exchange, to explain. Yep. Uh, we have a lot of infrastructure and manufacturing capabilities, final assembly line in the US. Yep. We are procuring from the US. We are selling to the US. And the US manufacturers are doing the same with Europe. So tariffs in the middle of the Atlantic would really be a big burden for both sides. And maybe that would be even uh, tougher for the US manufacturers. Uh, uh, have you been putting extra resources into the Alabama plant? Have you been stockpiling? Have you been, there's no kind of preparations or anything that you have been taking on thus far in order to get ready for something that could be coming? No, we could we keep doing what we've been right. doing so far, relying on Alabama indeed. Yeah. Um, that's a plant where we have uh, three final assembly lines. One is not yet delivering planes, but the two others are. So we are yeah. procuring from everywhere around the world, assembling there in the US with uh, US jobs, um, two US airlines as well. So I think we are key to the U.S. ecosystem, to the aviation ecosystem, and we think that plays a big role in how tariffs are targeted. Okay, final, final quick question. You sit on actually the business council in America. You speak to CEOs there. What message did you take to them from Europe? What is the message that should be coming to A, U.S. business, and B, the U.S. administration? Well, at the moment, uh, I think there's a lot of um, questioning of what, uh, where, all this is going, what it will mean yep. for which industry. Uh, it's a bit on wait and see mode to understand better for how long tariffs could come, uh, who will be impacted, how to respond 
uh, to the tariffs, if any. As I told you, yeah. we are not directly uh, targeted with tariffs at the moment. Uh, but indeed, there is a lot of uh, questioning uh, and uh, to understand better what is changing and how to adapt. We are in a world that is fast changing yeah. and it's a lot about adapting to those changes.